left it up there. The slides are up, yes? All right, okay, all right. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thank you for inviting me to um, speak to the Explorers Club. Uh, I guess we're sort of doing some Taoist exploring because, uh, you know, without going out of our door, we can know the ways of heaven. We're exploring, but we're all staying in. Uh, so there we go. Uh, but we're going to talk about um, something that in my book uh, called Dark Star Rising, Magic and Power in the Age of Trump, that the talk I gave in Berlin that Sarah uh, mentioned is uh, based on. And um, in it, I just reference something, I just say something, um, uh, this phrase just came into my mind as I was um, writing it, it was a uh, trickle down metaphysics. And basically it was the idea that um, with Trump and the arrival of uh, post-truth and alternative fact, it seemed to me that the kind of um, very radical um, ideas about truth and reality, and in many ways their tenuousness, that I had uh, read and listened to lectures about in university and read books about, and you know, deconstructionism and postmodernism, there were things talking about that. They, they, they seem to have left the academy and arrived in you know, sort of the mainstream world. And um, I, I don't for a minute assume that Trump even knows what postmodernism is. He may have heard about it in terms of architecture or something like that, or deconstructionism, or any of the things that, I, I was talking about in the book uh, in that part of it, and what I'll talk about uh, today. But it seemed that the idea of reality being malleable, reality being up for grabs, um, was something that he had grabbed onto and made use of in, in a very practical, utilitarian way. And uh, I discovered, um, as I was doing research for Dark Star Rising, that he had been trained in a kind of, uh, well, mental science, mental philosophy, positive thinking, we'll get onto this um, later on. Uh, in which that's precisely the, the main idea, that reality is malleable. And famously, um, his mantra is, facts don't matter. It's uh, your attitude toward facts that matter. And um, at the end, I'm just going to mention very briefly about uh, what I call the Goldilocks theory of history, which isn't necessarily related directly to uh, the, pre the previous sort of narrative I'll, I'll, I'll uh, lay out here. But it is in the sense that we, we find ourselves at, uh, uh, where that narrative has left us in the midst of several other sorts of uh, crises, <laughs> strange developments. And um, it's this notion of uh, somehow the notion of things being just right, um, kind of the middle way in, 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 a, in a very general sense. But in the first uh, place, um, oh God, why is this doing this now? I don't know why it's, it's doing this, but it's not. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to talk about, because uh, it starts with Nietzsche and it ends up with Trump, and Trump is um, the punchline. But we're going to talk about, uh, as I have the title up here, Untimely Nietzsche's Will to Power. And um, in the late 1800s, 1887 uh, or 88, uh, Nietzsche, who at the time was practically unknown and, and not well and uh, unread. Uh, he had an insight that as far as he could see would determine the future not only of Europe but of the world for the next two centuries. And what he saw he wrote in um, his notebooks. And his notebooks famously became uh, this book on the over here called The Will to Power. And uh, in a sense, the person who made that happen uh, was his sister, uh, who sadly got control of all of Nietzsche's uh, work um, after he collapsed in Turin in 1889. Uh, he's mad, if you know the famous story, where he embraced this horse that was being whipped, <clears throat> and uh, he fell into the street. And um, in his note, Nietzsche wrote, what I relate is the history of the next two centuries. I describe what is coming, and he added, ominously, what can no longer come differently. Now, what was it that was on its way and whose advance could not be halted? It was the advent of nihilism. Now, we'll get on to exactly what nihilism is in, in, in the next bit. But right now, I just want to focus on the strange, the strange, Nietzsche considered himself a man out of time in more than one way. Uh, he was untimely. Um, he uh, 
one of his early books was called Thoughts Out of Season, and it's also translated as Untimely Meditations. And in later works, like uh, The Antichrist, um, he, which was supposed to be um, the first part of this magnum opus that he, he intended to uh, write, that uh, he originally called The Revaluation of All Values. But then um, as he uh, most likely became aware that he was going, going off the deep end, uh, he, he changed course and he, uh, in a burst of uh, uh, creativity, um, you know, wrote, wrote the Antichrist and also um, Eke Homo and, and a variety of shorter works. So he didn't, he, he never actually put together uh, this great magnum opus that he wanted uh, to, to write at the end. And um, the idea that he did and that the will to power the collection of notes was something that was promulgated by his sister, but it never really was that. And she um, basically, yeah, she, she got control of all of, his, all of his works and she declared that this was the great uh, kind of work that, um, it, uh, it wasn't that it wasn't even not completed. Um, it's a collection of fragments that have been put together in different order by different editors. Um, but she was putting it across as this great work of his. And it's definitely, you know, worth, worth reading. It's anything written by Nietzsche is worth reading. So it's uh, not in any way saying it's not an important work, but it's not a book in the sense of Thus Begs Zarathustra as a book or, or the Antichrist or any of his other works and all that. Um, and you get the sense that he was aware, as I said, that he, he was, his time was running out. So he was a man out of time in the sense that he was untimely. His thoughts, his attitude, his views on the world were not the same as his contemporaries who didn't even know about him. And he was out of time in the sense that he was running out of time because he must have known that his, his uh, sanity was sort of uh, you know, uh, drifting away. And he has these wonderful rhetorical remarks like you know, in on the Antichrist, he says he doesn't write for today or tomorrow, but only the day after tomorrow belongs to me. And I, I think in a very uh, real sense that 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 chronology of not today, not even tomorrow, but the next, in, in a way refers to us, uh, in a way where, where the day after tomorrow that he's been writing about, or, or the, the last 50 or so years have, uh, have been that. And um, he says, some, some men are born posthumously, <laughs> which is one of the great lines. And he also hoped that his readers would be, because he didn't believe that his readers existed at the time that he was writing this. So he's looking, he's writing for his readers in the future, but what he says about them, is that when they read him, they will, when they discover him, they will look back to him in order to know the future. Because he will have already gone through what he calls uh, the, uh, he, he's lost himself in every labyrinth of the future. And because he is a soothsayer bird spirit who looks back, looks back when relating what is to come. So chronologically, Nietzsche's over there, he's seen what's on its way, and he's, look, he, and he's looking back to tell us who are to come uh, the, to explain the world that we live in today. So it's this wonderful uh, kind of cross, you know, chronology there and all that. And, um, but he's also, we can see him as a kind of shaman. We can see him as a wounded healer because he takes on the disease that's on its way. We, we, will, we, we have all contracted it already now at this time. Uh, but at the time Nietzsche's writing this in the 1880s, which you know, 100, 40 years ago, roughly, almost a century and a half ago. Um, he's seeing this thing that's on its way, nihilism, and, he, and he's going to go through it himself in order to go through the disease, the sickness, and not only to um, survive it or to recover, but to become even more healthy uh, after it. And sadly, I won't be able to go into exactly how Nietzsche proposes one can do that in this talk, but that, that was his idea. So he knew this was coming. There's no way to avoid it. The only way is to go into it head on. And, 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 and to overcome it. Um, so, but, but again, all this sense of un, untimeliness, is, it's, it's, it's so much about Nietzsche when, and if you know Zarathustra, when he comes down from the mountaintop, and this is the idea that it's trickle down metaphysics, because we, the, the beginning of this process uh, starts with Nietzsche alone, or Zarathustra alone on the lofty mountaintop, and, and he, he sees what's on its way. And he comes down from the mountain to tell the people, um, but they don't understand him. They do not understand me. I am in the mouth for these ears. But Nietzsche knew that was going to happen because even in the book before Zarathustra, um, uh, the gay science, the Frölicher Wissenschaft, 
um, this happy, happy science, you know, it's, it's, it's like philosophy is fun. <laughs> it's an adventure and all that uh, kind of thing, the free spirit. Um, this is when he announces God is dead. And he has uh, the figure, the madman, who goes to the marketplace. And he, like Diogenes in, in ancient uh, Greece, he has a lamp lit, lit during the day. And he's, he's, he he's wants to tell everyone, you know, what the news. Have you not heard that God is dead? And they don't, you know, they don't understand him at all. So no, no, Nietzsche was writing this, as I said, around 18, in gay science in 1882. So I started writing this during the summer. And 2020. It was a turbulent year. It's not over yet. <laughs> Strange things are happening still. But I wondered if, you know, the time that he was talking about, the day after tomorrow, the future of 200 years was the world that we were starting, starting to live in. And so um, what is nihilism? Now, nihilism, the word was coined by the Russian novelist Ivan uh, Turgenev in his novel Fathers and Sons in, uh, was it 1862? And um, this is, it, it, it means, uh, well, the Latin nihil means nothing. So it means belief in nothing. And this could mean like lack of belief in anything or an act of belief in nothing. So it's, it can be different things. One of my favorite uh, remarks about nihil, nihilism is from the historian Jacques Barzin, American historian who died a few years ago at the age of 104, I think. A uh, remarkable uh, man, but in his, uh, one of his last books called From Dawn to Decadence, which is this fantastic, huge doorstopper uh, history of, of the West for the last 500 years, he says, uh, the real nihilist believes in nothing and does nothing about it. Uh, so he was contrasting the real nihilist with an anarchist who believes in nothing, but unlike his less motivated cousin, but certainly wants to do something about it. So the anarchist is throwing bombs and bringing down society. But the nihilist wouldn't participate in that. That would just be a, a waste of, of energy. Uh, you know, he, he, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no sense in trying to change society. Um, so the nihilist is completely, you know, uh, ha, ha, has no hope for that, that kind of social change. Uh, and it's basically about this generational conflict um, in the 19th century between um, the 1840s generation were romantic idealists who believed in these ideals, believed in the, uh, the possibility of being able to change society. The main problem was freeing the serfs and also, you know, um, trying to reform Russian society, which was completely back in the Middle Ages and all that. And, um, and they believed in this kind of living by example. There were these characters called the beautiful souls. I write about them in my most recent book called The Return of Holy Russia. And they wanted to live by example. And, and to set high standards and things of that sort. But by the 1860s, you got the next generation that were known as the new men. And they were fed up with all the romantic idealism. They were, they were practical to the core. They were totally westernized and utilitarian. And they followed um, the sort of edicts of what became known as positivism. Uh, which has got nothing to do with thinking positively about it, even though we'll be thinking of talking about positive thinking later on. But um, it's the idea that the only thing we can make any positive statements about are, are the facts you know, of science. So uh, quantifiable, measurable, um, you know, kind of uh, physically you know, uh, uh, identifiable uh, sort of uh, proofed. Uh, facts or, or the things that we can talk about. So all this highfalutin notion of idealism and, and, and you know, human brotherhood and altruism and all that is just, is just rubbish. And um, after um, Turgenev, someone else who picked this up was Dostoevsky uh, in his novels, The Devils. And Dostoevsky was, um, we, you know, he's known as one of the fathers of existentialism. And basically he said, okay, let's take this idea that the, that the new men are talking about. And fundamentally, it's the idea that if nothing is true, then everything is permitted. If there isn't this moral world, if, if there isn't this religious world outside the physical world, then, you know, um, utilitarian values are the only ones we should go by, the greatest good of the greatest number or, or you know, pleasure. And that leads down to a purely socialist, uh, social materialist kind of worldview. And if you know his novel, The Devils, the new men come to town and it's, it's just about these, these hyper radical uh, revolutionaries. And at the end of the story, there's a whole town is completely in flames. There's bodies strewn left and right, you know, um, and you know, murders and suicides. And so this is what happens along, according to Dostoevsky when the progressive ideas of the new men uh, come to town. But where Nietzsche differed from this kind of nihilism is that it, he didn't, it wasn't localized in um, 
a particular social conflict, or he didn't also allow for the religious or spiritual response to it that Dostoevsky offers in uh, like the last novel, like the Brothers Karamazov, um, where it's a kind of spiritual response to I Ivan's is one of the new men and he rejects God because he can't accept the universe full of suffering, but his brother Alyosha has this ex spiritual experience and he's able to affirm everything um, because he's, he's, he's had a you know, complete transfiguring uh, experience of the divine. And uh, Nietzsche doesn't allow for that, although he himself has a kind of transfiguring experience, but it's not about the divine, it's about this vitality, it's about the ubermensch and, and, and uh, the power of life, and what, which come, it came to him in his own experience during his convalescence from his many bouts of illness and all that. Uh, so um, unlike these nihilists who are saying there's no values at all, he's saying, yes, I agree with you that the old values don't work anymore, but we can create new values, we can live creatively. This is the spirit of the gay science and Zarathustra saying, this is the call of the Ubermensch, you know. Um, so it's a broader kind of view. And um, I, I, I say in the, novel, in, in the essay that uh, Marx had warned that there was a specter, you know, haunting um, Europe. But uh, for Nietzsche, that wrath, communism was just the party crasher. Because the real specter for Nietzsche uh, was the spirit, the spirit of nihilism. And he asks, whence comes this uncanniest of all guests? How, how did we arrive at this state? Uh, at, at precisely at the time when, you know, the mainstream intellectual environment was talking about progress and the advances of science and, you know, um, going on to the future on the stepping stones of our ancestors and all, all that kind of thing. And he's saying, no, this is, all, <laughs> this is all heading to a big kind of, you know, car accident of, of, of nothingness. And how did we get to there? And he said, well, um, he writes, because the values we have had hitherto thus draw their final consequence. Because nihilism represents the ultimate logical conclusion of our great values and ideals. So the very pursuit of truth, the very pursuit uh, in both the philosophical or later scientific way, we'll get onto that, and the religious pursuit of truth, and we have these two uh, individuals here, Plato and Jesus, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Nietzsche, uh, Plato is basically kind of Nietzsche's philosophical target, but uh, not so much Christ himself, but the Christianity that uh, grew around Christ, Nietzsche, you know, despised, but not Christ himself. He respected, he said there was only one Christian and he died on the cross, so he respected Christ. But uh, the Platonizing of Christianity, it's basically the notion that this world is just a shadow and the real world is some higher world beyond. This world doesn't mean anything. This world is valueless. So this is a veil of tears, or this is a kind of antechamber to the next world. This world will judge and will go to heaven or hell or something like that. So this world is devalued in both Plato and, and Christianity. And, uh, and they're seeking this truth. And Nietzsche is saying that the very pursuit of truth, both in the religious and scientific sense, which the West has held as the acme of perfection, Right? and the obligation to honesty that compels us to obey it, have arrived at the paradoxical truth that there is no truth, capital T, in the sense of some objective reality that our intellectual and spiritual integrity demands we acknowledge. So the spiritual integrity that demands that we acknowledge truth has arrived at the truth that there isn't the kind of truth that we've all been looking for. Uh, it's, he doesn't say relative, but he uses perspectival. The, 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 truth, is, the truth is perspectival. The, the, all, all views of the universe are a particular perspective on it. So there's no ultimate one view. And he said, you know, fundamentally, he says, if you had some kind of all-seeing eye, it wouldn't be any different from the universe itself. So you need to have some kind of differentiated, individuated, um, you know, point of perspective in order to have a view of the universe. And that, that um, by definition, excludes you know, a great deal of it. And so, um, so this is, so the very pursuit of truth itself, um, and mostly what has led us to this uh, impasse is this kind of scientific truth. And so surely one might say, okay, yes, we agree that, no, there isn't any higher ideal world that Plato thought, and there isn't a loving God overlooking all of us and, you know, taking care of us and giving meaning to our lives. That isn't happening. But um, surely, surely science, um, you know, is arriving at truth, but Nietzsche would say, well, actually, no, uh, because, uh, <laughs> as we'll see, uh, just like Donald Trump, um, 
Nietzsche says science bases itself on what he calls facts, but he's saying there are no facts. Facts are interpretations, very profitable interpretations. Um, they work very well. They allow us to, you know, have, they've allowed us to conquer the world as it were, uh, but they don't tell us the truth in the sense of what, what reality is really like. It's an interpretation of reality uh, aimed at um, our own uh, kind of practical and utilitarian sort of value. So he calls, he calls what the scientists say are facts or they're a kind of error without which a certain type of animal finds it impossible to live. Um, so they're false and he's not alone in that. Um, I have the picture of Henri Bergson here who was a younger contemporary of Nietzsche. At one point he was like famous, world famous Nobel Prize winner and he was interested in psychic phenomena and parapsychology and spiritualism and all that kind of stuff. So times have changed. But um, he, uh, as Nietzsche basically went off the deep end, Bergson, was, his star was starting to rise. And um, he would have agreed that with Nietzsche because he says that the intellect is an organ in the service of life. So reason and the intellect and science and all of this and you know all the great ability we have to understand things is in the service of life itself. And um, he would agree with Nietzsche that the value for life is ultimately decisive. So the truth that science reveals does not tell us what the world is really like. They're, they're practical, uh, useful interpretations of things. And you know, they're the best we have in order to you know, maneuver through the world, but they don't tell us exactly what the world is like in itself. Um, we are able to perceive that to some degree, but science isn't the thing that does that. We'll see later on that someone will talk about, uh, uh, says poetry and, and, and uh, art and things of that sort um, uh, do that. And uh, yeah, well, he's uh, the next person here on the list. And um, I, I should say, I had this funny experience concerning Heidegger just earlier this evening, just before this talk. Um, I don't know, maybe around five o'clock, it was killing some time. And I just pulled off the shelf a, an old anthology of crime stories uh, edited by Dorothy Sayers from the 1920s called The Omnibus of Crime. And I just was flipping through it. It's a book I've had for years. I never read through the whole thing, but occasionally I just read something up. And I opened it up and it was one of the Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, The Adventure of the Priory School, which I've read many times, but I didn't remember exactly you know, the plot. And I started reading, reading it, read a page or two, and at the very bottom of the page, one page, oh, and just before I got to the bottom of this page, I thought to myself, wow, you know, I'm going to be talking about Heidegger this evening, and reading this is a lot easier <laughs> than reading Heidegger, because if you read Heidegger, he's, you know, he's, he's, not, um, he's not a page turner. Uh, and um, at the bottom, two seconds after I thought that, at the bottom of the page, there's a, a, a sentence said, uh, uh, Heidegger, the German master, was missing. <laughs> so there's a Professor Heidegger in the story. And I unconsciously must have known that because I read the story many times, but it, it, I didn't consciously think, oh, yes. Because I pulled, it, it, wasn't, in, it wasn't in the collection of home stories you know, that, that, that I was reading that, that it's, it's in. It was in this other anthology. So it was one of these strange synchronicities that happened. Uh, any case, but Martin Heidegger uh, was someone who took... Uh, Nietzsche's announcement of the advent of nihilism very, very seriously. And along with Ludwig Wittgenstein, he's probably uh, the most influential philosopher of the 20th century. Uh, he agreed with Nietzsche that Plato was the source of the problem, but his response was rather different uh, than Nietzsche's. And they're, they're radically different kind of philosophers, radically different kind of men, uh, I, I would say. I mean, Nietzsche, if you know his work, he's, he's probably the most readable philosopher. Um, and I know I've, I've only read him in the translations, but the translations themselves are you know, beautiful. Walter Kaufman or R.J. Hollingdale are the ones I, I've been reading for years. And there's only a few philosophers that are readable. Schopenhauer is another one. Kierkegaard. Bergson's readable too. Uh, it's very fluent, uh, lovely, uh, mellifluous, uh, logical uh, uh, language. Um, but most philosophers aren't, aren't that readable. And, and Heidegger is <laughs> one, of the worst, one of the worst offenders. And um, he... I mean, Nietzsche gives us a kind of dance with his, his, his writing and he uses punctuation and, and, and dashes and all this sort of thing when it, it, things are moving very quickly and he infers things and he, he assumes that his reader is going to know where he's going even when he doesn't say things. And Heidegger is very different. He just stretches things out, this enormous prolix, uh, 
uh, uh, prose and he invents neologisms and uses words in a strange way. And it has its own effect. It has its own hypnotic effect. You can start to get a feeling for what he's talking about, but it isn't the kind of, um, you know, kind of Mozartian kind of, you know, wonderful uh, 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 brio that, that, that Nietzsche's uh, writing is. And, um, you know, there's some, um, Nietzsche himself in, in uh, Ecce Homo, um, again, it's one of the most tragic and, and, and sad uh, books ever written because he was going out of his mind. And he says in it, do not mistake me for somebody else. What, what he doesn't want to happen to him is, 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 you know, people to misunderstand him. And that's precisely what happens. I mean, his sister was the first one. And then pretty much everybody until, uh, well, until people like Walter Kaufman and R.J. Hollingdale started doing their translations. But Heidegger, too, is someone that, you know, some Nietzsche scholars have said have kind of taken Nietzsche and misinterpreted him. And, and even though he wrote this huge, vast, you know, um, well, it was a long lecture series on the will to power and, and all that. And, but he's the one, he's one of the ones who takes the will to power, that, that collection of notes as an ex, as a book, as this final work of metaphysics that Nietzsche um, produced. And he said that even though Nietzsche, what Nietzsche wanted to do was overcome metaphysics, he wanted to overcome this whole notion of the other world, and so that this world would, would, would regain its, its, its true value and all that. He didn't actually do that. His notion of the will to power, which again is a sad, it's, it's, interest, it's, it's sad and it's strange with Nietzsche because he's such a wonderful writer and a wordsmith that when it came to his central vision, will to power, it doesn't exactly say what he wants it to say. And it's misinterpreted all the time, meaning power over someone else. And it isn't that. And this is, you can understand it if you recognize his distinction, uh, why he didn't accept Darwinian um, uh, notion of evolution, or at least the notion of survival of the fittest, because he says, um, only an or organism in distress wants to survive. If an organism is not in distress, if it's actually healthy and living, but it doesn't want to survive, it is surviving. What it wants to do is express its energy, ex ex live and to grow and to be and all this. So he said the will to power, meaning that, it, you know, if, if we're healthy and we have this power and energy and this life in us, we want to express it, we want to be creative and whatever. And, you know, but it, it, it turns into, you know, the wills are mocked and this is Hitler and all that kind of stuff. And this, again, these are people that misappropriated Nietzsche you know, and others did as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's a shame that in one sense, one of the main philosophers who took Nietzsche's idea seriously was Heidegger and that he kind of did a number on Nietzsche, but at the same time, um, he um, has his own interesting approach to this. And he said he, he believes that we have a wrong turn at Plato. We need to go back to the pre-Socratic pre philosophers because we've forgotten the question of being. This is the, um, he what Heidegger says is that what's happened in Western philosophy from Plato on is the question of being, the fundamental notion of just isness, istikite, you know, Dasein, you know, the being there. You know, the, our, our givenness, our, our here we are in the world. What is it like to be in the world? And we, we've lost track of that in this erection of this Western metaphysics having to do with rational metaphysical ideas about the, the nature of this or the essence of that and, you know, Platonic higher worlds. And he wants to go back to the earlier philosophers who, who were, had this immediate kind of contact with, with pure, immediate kind of being. And um, I mean, you, you, we have these moments where we become aware of being ourselves, ourselves, and when we, if it, whenever it happens, when you suddenly feel like you're just surprised that you exist, or you're surprised that something else exists. I mean, it's the kind of thing we ask when we were a kid, and kids still ask adults this, and get, uh, you know, uh, get their parents very um, um, upset about it and, and confused because they can't answer it. And um, you know, it's the same kind of thing if you're in a philosophy one on one class and you, you raise this sort of question, it's like, oh well, we can't really follow this. But this is the sort of thing where uh, Heidegger is saying that we need to get back to this. And funnily enough, his contemporary, um, very much contemporary, uh, uh, the uh, esoteric uh, teacher, uh, G.I. Gorgiev, um, he too said that human beings fundamental problem is that we've forgotten our sense of being. We no longer have a sense of being. And um, I mean, for Heidegger, this leads into what he calls inauthenticity, and this kind of false life and, uh, you know, we, uh, Dasman and, you know, we become part of the crowd and they, and we, we've got to give up our own 
kind of radical individ individual uh, individuality in order to conform to the mass. And Nietzsche says something very similar. He talks who are asleep or mechanical. And strangely enough, uh, they both wrote very difficult books to read. Heidegger's Being in Time, Nietzsche's Beelzebub Tales to His Grandson, if you ever come across it. It's, it's uh, this magnificent monument of uh, parenthetical uh, remarks and dependent clauses and neologisms and, and uh, strange syntax. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, again, it's a strange book. And, um, but they also shared the idea that the one surefire method of reminding us of being was if we have a very vivid, um, urgent sense of our own death and the death of everyone around us. So strangely enough, two very different sides. Uh, they probably didn't know each other, or I mean, know of each other. Um, and they probably wouldn't have thought much of each other had they known each other, but they're both approaching the same thing. And I have this uh, picture here of Dr. Johnson uh, because they would probably have agreed with uh, this famous remark of Dr. Johnson that um, um, the writer Colin Wilson often quoted in Wilson's work, but he's a very big influence on my own work. Uh, Johnson said, the thought that a man will be hanged in a fortnight concentrates the mind wonderfully. Uh, so yes, if you know you're going to be hanged in a fortnight, uh, you remember being. Suddenly, it's the only thing uh, that becomes uh, really important to you. Um, so, um, okay, yeah. So what what we needed to do is get back to this kind of world of wonder uh, for for Heidegger, and this, I'll get onto it in a bit. This is when he later starts writing about poetry. But um, we can say that um, there are sort of two main um, kind of sort of, you know, currents that came out of um, Heidegger's work. Although that's simplifying it um, uh, greatly. And one um, was uh, existentialism. Um, and I mentioned Dostoevsky and, uh, and Nietzsche was considered sort of the father's existentialism, Kierkegaard is another. But Heidegger is one of the ones who put it on the sort of philosophical academic kind of map, even though he denied that he was an existentialist, but that's, that's a whole other story. It, but it's most properly associated with um, Jean-Paul Sartre and, um, and came into wide public attention in the years following World War II. The existentialists of La Rive Gauche, Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and Albert Camus, uh, they were a kind, not exactly the same, but kind of a sophisticated uh, anticipation of the beat generation of the 50s, although very, very different, much more intellectual. But they took up some of the, uh, the beats took up some of their attitudes. And I say in my essay, among, among them were promiscuity, heavy drinking, and, and black turtlenecks. And they gave an American twist, but the existentialists were much more intellectual. But they too accepted the idea that the values of the pre-war period were hollow and empty. And um, one, one could no longer, one could no longer except this kind of humanism or this notion that there was a human project um, in the sense of pro uh, progress and, and, and things of that sort. And um, the people who still accepted this or the people who refused to face the strange ambiguity of being, have this experience, this encounter with being, um, they, they, they were absurd. Uh, and Sartre uh, called them salauds, which is bastards, uh, or, or worse in French. And they were guilty of what he called mauvaise foi, which is um, uh, bad faith, living inauthentically, which meant that they were aware, let's say, of this kind of existential question of, of being and our existence and why are we here and what are we supposed to do now that we are, but they put it aside and they, they accept the, you know, whatever uh, conformist kind of persona and identity um, is, is given to them. So if, you know, if they're a bartender, that's all they are, or whatever, if they're a lawyer, that's all they are. They, 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 they assume what their persona is, rather than uh, confront this kind of the, the nothingness of all that and have a, have a real authentic confrontation uh, with being. And um, I mean, the, the essence of existentialism is Sartre's famous pronouncement that ex it, uh, for human beings, existence precedes essence which means that a, a chair exists, there's a reason for the chair, okay? The chair is to be s sat upon. I'm doing it myself and I assume you people are too. But um, there's no reason for our existence. We find ourselves here in the world. Uh, Heidegger talks about Geworfenheit or thrownness. You know, we're here, we don't have a rough guide. Uh, no one's exactly telling us what to do. Kierkegaard says, I'd like to speak to the director and, and all of this. And the ones who don't face this, um, they, are, they are these, you know, salauds, they are these bastards, um, uh, and this, this is the bourgeois. And this is how, uh, eventually, if you need to follow Sartre's career, he went from existentialism and he tried to wed existentialism and Marxism, you know, uh, which doesn't really 
um, critique of dialectical materialism. It just doesn't work. Um, and he, he, you know, he was famously, you know, waving Mao's uh, little red book in, in, in <laughs> Paul Saint Michel uh, in Paris in the '70s and getting in trouble for that. Um, but the other uh, kind of current flowing out of out of Heidegger's um, dismantling uh, is deconstructionism, and um, Sartre focused on this this phenomenological analysis uh, that Heidegger did of human being. You know, this, uh, what, is, what, what does it mean? What does it mean to be in the world? What is it like? I was saying, we are here. What is it like to be here? Uh, it's not. It's a descriptive work. It's not an explanation. It's it's descriptive. How how is it with us in the world? Sort of thing. And if you know your Heidegger, there's often these you know train of words together that are with hyphens. They're supposed to be sort of this is the one thought that we're following here. And um, again, we said that what was needed to get back to um, it, it was, it, well, there was this idea, both with uh, Heidegger, we already said, he'd get back to Plato. Uh, Heidegger's teacher is his precursor, Edmund Husserl, who's the founder of this, phenomenal, uh, this philosophical um, discipline known as phenomenology, out of which existentialism came, um, in the sense that Heidegger was a student or um, un under um, Husserl, and then he rediscovered Kierkegaard and then kind of took Husserl's notion where Husserl didn't want to go back to the pre-Socratics, but his battle, philosophical battle card was back to the things themselves. And this is why he developed a discipline known as phenomenology. It's a study of phenomena. It's a study of how, how things appear in the way that they appear. So traditional philosophy is about the noumena, the world of causes. What makes things the way they are? So, you know, Kant, if you know your Kant, he says there's the, the way that we see the world you know, through our senses and all that. And then there's the world in itself, the ding on zeke. And that's the world of causes. We, ne we can never perceive that world in the same way that we perceive this world, but we can somehow rationally intuit it. And uh, Husserl's saying, let's forget everything we think we know about reality. Let's forget what all the philosophers have said. And let us just concentrate on describing things, the things that appear to us in the way they appear to us. So let's let's get let's get make what he wanted to make was a descriptive science about it. And um, he thought eventually we could get to some kind of bedrock of truth and, and objective reality this way. And this Heidegger uh, uh, split company with him uh, on that. But um, again, Heidegger said we need to get back to this earlier earlier pre-Socratic time when we. Uh, the philosophers then, or he called them thinkers, actually make a distinction. They were thinkers. They had this immediate encounter with being. And what that produced was as much poetry as philosophy. If you know your early pre-Socratic philosophers like Parmenides and Empedocles, uh, they wrote these long kind of poems, that, the, uh, poems that are philosophical tracks at the same time. And um, so Heidegger starts to write more and more about poetry and art, and he was uh, quite taken with uh, the German poet uh, Friedrich Hüdelin. And instead of being in time, he starts, he never finishes the second part of being in time. His first, uh, his major philosophical work, being in time, was a truncated masterpiece. That's the first half, he never finishes the second half. Probably rightly so, because in the end, he wants to dismantle metaphysics, so he probably didn't want to add <laughs> to the work he had to do. Uh, but he writes a lot about poetry. And he makes a distinction in his later work. It's no longer being in time. It's what he calls lighting and presence. Lichtung, which is wonderful German. Uh, lighting is translated as opening to. It, it's the kind of space in which things appear and present themselves. Uh, and uh, presence makes itself present, what he calls Anwesenheit. So in Lichtung, Anwesenheit <laughs> appears. And um, truth, for Heidegger, Again, it's not factual, it's the unconcealment. It's a Greek term, uh, aletheia, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's unconcealment. Things are, things are revealed to us. And again, it's very much like phenomenology. It's, it's a, let's look at things. Let's not try to impose what we think we know about them anymore. Let us just look at them. And um, what uh, uh, happens, um, I, I, was, I should have, okay, well, I was going to say that one, uh, let me just get back to Heidegger just a little bit more. I, 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 in my notes, it's further on, but I'll say it here. Heidegger changes his approach and he starts talking about this notion of Gelassenheit, which goes back to the 13th century um, German theologian and mystic Meister Eckhart. And um, 
it's a way rather than applying kind of a rigorous methodology to undress phenomena to get them back to their primal essence. It's a way of just letting go of your attempt to do anything with them and, and for them to speak, speak to them. So Heidegger moves towards a more mystical uh, kind of uh, approach to things, but he still, he still has this, there is this presence that's there. There's a presence that's there. And if, if, if we know how to let go and let it speak, it will, it will appear and it will speak to us. And okay, so the person who really picks up on um, this dismantling notion of Western metaphysics that Heidegger starts is Jacques Derrida. And I think this is a wonderful photograph. I mean, he looks like, he looks like, I don't know, it looks like he's in a rock group or um, he looks like he was in um, the fifth essence or something like that. Or, I don't know, he just looks like a science fiction kind of character to me there. And um, um, he's a well-known proponent of uh, literary movement destruction, uh, deconstructionism. It got its start in the 1960s. And uh, just as postmodernism did, so they're generally allied. And the two, two of them would pretty much conquer the academic world in the States in, in the late um, uh, 20th century. I, I, I know when I was in university it, it, in the humanities department, they were the hottest thing uh, in town. And um, like Heidegger, Derrida wants to dismantle Western metaphysics, but unlike Heidegger, he doesn't believe, not only is there no being anymore, there's not even a presence, there's, there's an absence. There's a, uh, there's a kind of nothingness behind things. And um, he too starts with Husserl. His, his early kind of work is, is, is about Husserl. And Husserl himself would agree that, yes, we need to clear up a lot of rubbish that has accreted itself around our idea of philosophy. And you know, the late 19th century, early 20th century philosophy was kind of a mess. That's why you have this kind of clearing house when, when Wittgenstein comes in. Um, Husserl is still in that old tradition, but he, he, he believes that through a rigorous methodological procedure, we can clear away all the rubbish that's accreted around um, our subject, which is phenomena, the, the world, and, and we can get to some kind of truth. Uh, but Heidegger forgets that. And, and Husserl writes, you know, he, he's aware that science is heading in the wrong direction too. One of his last books, The Crisis of European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology, which he didn't finish. Um, he, he saw the same kind of problem that Heidegger was reacting against in his own writings against science on technology, where it's, it's about practical utilitarian value and it's, it, it, it's um, a, a fact-based um, approach that leaves out all notions of meaning and any kind of connectedness and all that. And, and Husserl and Whitehead got nothing to do with this tradition, but he was writing about this at the same time too showing how the scientific approach was undermining itself. Um, but, um, yeah, okay. But Derrida, um, again, he, he says there's no kind of um, presence. Uh, there's, there's nothing uh, but language and words, which plays upon itself and the meanings are unstable. And, and Heidegger talks about language being the house, language is the house of being and poets are kind of the architects and, and the, the, you know, the, the construction company who comes and build the house. But Derrida is saying, well, no, it's not, it doesn't really, have, language doesn't have a house. It kind of pitches a tent here and there and doesn't stay in one place for any, any particular time. And it's always moving around and changing and it's fluctuating and all that. And um, we can't get outside of language to ever reach any kind of real world that's beyond uh, our, you know, language world. It's almost as if, you know, there's like a cellophane wrapping on the world that's made of language and we can't pierce it in order to, in order to get to it. And um, he bases his notion um, of what he calls difference, saying that the meaning of words isn't about, meaning of words doesn't come from the things that they are associated with. So the word tree, it doesn't have any real relation to an actual tree. It's, there's an arbitrary, you know, relation to it. Um, it doesn't in any way have treeness in it. It has its meaning because um, it, 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 it's in the context of all the other words. So you have, uh, and this is based on the work of the Swiss linguist uh, Frederick Saussure. And um, in a nutshell, it's you have, there's the signified, which is the world, whatever you want to use language to point to. And there's the signifiers, which are the words you use to point to those things. But there's no real relation between them. Um, and it's completely arbitrary. And it all works because every, everyone accepts the system. So if you accept the criteria of the system, 
the rules of the system, then you could any you could use any kind of language. You know, in a way, this relates to Wittgenstein's uh, notion that you can't have a private language because uh, it, it has to be part of a broader kind of context. So um, th there's a kind of there's the world which we never actually. We talk about it all the time, but we actually never really get to it. It's the kind of the ding on Zeke. You don't even have to go looking for the ding on Zeke anymore because there's the world we never quite ever see anymore because we have this wrapping of language over it, which doesn't reflect truth in any way. It just reflects other, other words. That's very different from, say, um, like the mystical traditions of like Kabbalah, uh, which you know, sees uh, uh, um, language and, and letters in the alphabet as, as actually being part of the creation itself uh, at least the Hebrew alphabet is, is so endowed uh, but you know this is uh, and you know one one finds it hard to accept that a poet who, who's using language and through language is revealing mystery and the simplest things would, would think that he's just you know um, you know mouthing um, contingent arbitrary sounds uh, but you know this is this is this is gets picked up this gets picked up uh, and it's becomes um, uh, very, very popular, the height of fashion in the academic world. Um, I mean, this, these are, you know, uh, three well-known literary critics um, back in, say, the 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, um, um, Roland Barthes, uh, Paul Deman, and um, uh, Jeffrey Hartman, and, um, you know, um, uh, Roland Barth, you know, he's one who's talking about the death of the author. The, the, there's no such thing as the intention of the author. Language is this kind of sea. And we, we, think, we think we know what we want to say using language. Once we set off on it, it has its own currents and all this. And the whole idea was to be able to pick apart some text. And, oh, this is what the, this is what the author thought he was going to say. This is what he thinks it means. But actually, uh, you, it's the metaphor is if you find a kind of loose thread and you pull that thread, and it's what, it's what called the, the aporia, which is this kind of inconsistency in the text. And you pull that, and all these other inconsistencies um, uh, are revealed. And then suddenly, ooh, the author is saying all this other stuff that he really didn't know. And this whole idea that the individual doesn't really have any, any power over language. Language uses the individual. Language is one of, one of these mysterious social forces uh, that, that uh, uh, we are just kind of nodal points of a variety of social forces. So the language is one of them and there's a variety of other kind of currents around. So this old romantic idea that the individual had a choice and could decide what he wants to say, that, that, that is shown to be very jejun. And it's also a great relief. And it's around the same time as the, as the structuralists, the post-structuralists and people like Foucault, because by this time, everyone was so tired of existentialism and, and its insistence on responsibility and choice, because the existentialist is like, you know, we are responsibility for our choices in the world. You know, we, we are responsible for what we do, uh, and unless we're going to live in, in authentic lives and, you know, um, be, be, uh, embrace bad faith. And so there's this heaviness, there's a kind of sense of, you know, uh, onerous um, duty all the time. It's like, whew, wow, actually, we, no, no, that, that's just an illusion because actually we're, we're moved and swayed around by language. And this can lead to some, you know, rather dubious things. I mean, um, I don't know if he's read that much anymore, but Paul Deman, um, uh, it was very, very popular, very big in, in um, humanities um, uh, departments in, in universities in America, but it became known that uh, in, in Belgium he had written sort of pro-Nazi um, propaganda and anti-Semitic kind of works, and he kind of fiddled around with saying, well, it's just language kind of things, like, I didn't really mean it, and it's just the sort of, it's the kind of thing where, like, well, you know, um, uh, one wants a kind of responsibility and, uh, and, and uh, kind of obligation to truth and honesty. And uh, if you're saying these things no longer exist, uh, it can become dubious. And again, Jeffrey Harbin, he's one of the, the big names in, in America. And um, the, the, one, of the, 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 one of the other, um, uh, uh, oh, I, I was just gonna say, if, uh, going back to the Likrits, if, if you know Sartre's novel Nausea, uh, in a way, it's outside of that, but it, it gives a good example of what the, what the world is like when you suddenly real, when you have this insight that language just doesn't tell us anything about the world. It's just like a coding we have on it. And if you know those episodes where he had the, uh, Ro Quentin has his hand on, like on the doorknob, and it's like, what is this strange thing in my hand? And he's having a kind of, you know, weird kind of um, episode. And then there's another incident where he's, he's seeing sort of a, a, a root of a tree, and it's, it, it's this strange, strange thing to him. And incidentally, you know, there's the whole story about how the novel Nausea 
was inspired by a bad mescaline trip that um, uh, Sartre had had in 1938. So again, it's this notion that language is, is a kind of something, a gauze we put over the world to, to make it conform to our understanding of things. And um, we saw, saw the recognition of that as having a kind of existential terror. The postmodernists are sort of seeing it as kind of fun. Well, we can play around with things then, you know. And, um, but by the time, uh, around, around the same time as the deconstructionist stuff is happening, so we have the rise of postmodernity and, uh, and the and postmodernism. And of course, postmodernism is one of these things that you can't define because it resists definition, because it doesn't have an essence, and it, it's, it's part of many, many things. And it, it kind of first started with architecture, uh, learning from Las Vegas. You know, it was a book about um, getting rid of the modern style, which is very boring and flat and geometric and uh, unornamental. And then um, I forget who wrote the book, Learning from Las Vegas, I can't remember now. But it was all about looking at kind of, you know, um, gaudy uh, casinos and, and um, hotels and uh, drive-in coffee houses, and coffee shops and things like that. So, and it was this notion that you can slap lots of things together. But in a general sense, it's sort of the end of the modern dream, the idea that, as um, um, uh, uh, Leotard here says, is that in the postmodern condition is that these narratives that drove the previous modern world, um, progress, or science, or whatever, uh, uh, liberal democracy, whatever it was, these have broken down. They, they no longer, uh, they're no longer credible. Uh, we, we can't really accept them anymore. So we're postmodern in that sense. Um, we're, we're, we're whatever comes after the modern um, kind of uh, world. And um, another big name in that was uh, Baudrillard. Um, who basically is one of the ones who says, well, what's happened in this, this postmodern world we're in now is that the simulation has taken over from the reality. So this is another way in which uh, there's a kind of um, uh, dismantling or at least a substitution of, of what we took to be reality uh, that the, you know, um, Heidegger is working on and Nietzsche and all that. It's in, it's in, in the whole idea of the, of the um, virtual world. I mean, he's talking early on about television and all that. And we can go back to Guy Debord and you're talking about the uh, society of the spectacle. Um, but uh, it, it's the idea that the simulation, uh, the representation has taken over from the reality. And um, this, this is one of several avenues of a kind of, what should we say, uh, unhinging of our standard idea of reality that I seem uh, to see taking place of, over the last several years. And in the Dark Star Rising, I, kind of, I put Trump as, a, he's, he's kind of at the center of, of, these, uh, of uh, a nodal point of a variety of different ideas about reality being malleable. And, and, um, you know, uh, and, and especially with Trump, we'll get onto it because of the whole notion about reality TV. Uh, so we have this notion that, um, the, the simulation of reality is taking over from reality itself. And it's, it's uh, no longer something that's available for us in this unmediated way. Uh, we're less and less in touch with any kind of unmediated reality. Um, and, um, you know, we, the, the sort of main agent of that uh, condition is the ubiquitous you know, smartphone. So most of our experience are actually, because really, all we experience is the phone in our hand and looking at the screen. So <laughs> most of the vicarious experience we have, or the mediated experience of the world comes through this, this sort of thing. And I, I, I like this image here of uh, people, I guess they have the 3D glasses on, but I like the idea. It's sort of, it's like we're in Plato, they're in Plato's cave, if you know the myth of the cave, you know, human beings are in a cave and there's a fire behind them and people are moving these statues and the shadows cast on the wall. And we think what we see on the wall, the shadows is reality, but the real reality is outside somewhere. And the philosopher goes and sees it. But here they're in the cave, but they even have dark glasses on in the cave. So it's even um, a bit more. Uh, and um, so one of the things, so, what, so what's happening? All right, so we get in this position where I said reality is up for grabs. And at the same time that you have it in the academies, it's happening uh, in you know, people's homes on television you know, with reality TV being the you know, most famous, uh, not most famous, the, the, the most popular uh, form of entertainment now. And um, you know, the fundamental 
notion who said uh, of, of a kind of um, you know, stable fix objective reality that's amenable to being known, that's real and true for all cultures at all times. You know, that's so 20th century now. Uh, and this is, uh, I guess, one of the main kind of confrontational points about this is in the whole, you know, argument about or controversy about uh, gender and all that, where biology is a bad word uh, in some places because it's about things that we just can't change. It's just how it is. And oh, no, um, that's not true. Everything is historically generated. Everything is culturally generated, which is the fundamental postmodern and deconstructive take on things. There isn't any objective fixed reality that's true at all times. Anything is culturally generated. It's, and this is, this is why people like Jordan Peterson say it's a kind of Marxism because it's fundamentally an historicism. You know, values uh, and truths are generated through history. They, they, don't, they don't exist up above history in some way that Plato or any kind of spiritual teaching uh, uh, suggests. Uh, and um, there's no essence to anything, you know? There's no essence to anything because an essence means something that you, you, you can't change, you can't alter, that that's how it is. And there's no human nature, you know? There's a human situation, but there's no human nature because again, nature means it's some, some um, ornery, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, just uh, uncompromising part of reality that refuses to, you know, change to the way you want it to be. So we don't like that idea. We, we like to be able to get in and, and manipulate everything. And um, I mean, I, I found this out when I was in university and essentialist because I just, and this is a long time ago. Now, now I, you know, I, you know, you know, you might be get attacked in the streets or something, depending where you are. But the, that whole idea is a kind of metaphysical imperialism. And it's an expression of the Eurocentric, phallogocentric, dead white male dominated structure of discourse uh, that suppressed all alternative discourses, certainly since Plato, or so we're told. So, so now Plato is not only, you know, he made some mistakes about interpreting reality, he's, he's responsible for like everything horrible that's happened, uh, you know, throughout Western history, through you know, all, all of the oppression. Uh, uh, that, um, you know, we're, we're told about these days uh, happens now. And um, postmodernism, deconstructionism, they arrived, they were going to dismantle this kind of thing, and they were going to move things in a generally left direction. Jerry Darwin was a Marxist, um, you know, Barth, so, you know, most, they're all pretty much Marxists or in that kind of general camp. But the weird thing is, you know, that what they're, basing a lot of their work on, a great deal of it, is not men of the left, men of the right. Nietzsche, well, Nietzsche was neither left or right. He was up above um, politics, but he certainly wasn't, wasn't a leftist. Heidegger certainly wasn't a leftist. He, he was a uh, member of the Nazi party for, for a while. That's, that, that's created quite, quite a lot of uh, metaphysical journalism uh, there. Uh, but in the strange sea change that happens in the late 60s, uh, where you have here, this is May 68, you know, the, the almost revolution uh, in, in France that, that uh, brought Paris uh, to its knees. Uh, in this book that I, when I was, this is back in my undergraduate days, I was doing my degree in philosophy. I was, my, one of my professors said, don't let anybody see you reading this book. This is like, ooh, dangerous book to read, closing the American mind. But uh, this is about exactly what happened in, in the American universities, at least, um, where postmodernism and deconstructionism, with the help of the Frankfurt School, and one of their most popular uh, members here is Herbert Marcuse, um, they did this weird kind of melange of Heidegger, Nietzsche, Marx. And I, well, you know, he, he, was, he was a student of Heidegger and, and a Hegelian and a Marxist, so it's kind of, um, and it's a weird kind of thing where it's, they bring antithetical cultural and philosophical kind of traditions and arguments together to make, make, make this kind of revolutionary uh, uh, kind of blamage that informs this, this kind of time. But, but the, the, the battle cries of May 68, you know, uh, take your desires for reality, power to the imagination. These were going to be on the syllabi of uh, literature and philosophy classes in the next uh, kind of decade. And um, they would produce what one critic of this uh, called the ten the, a generation of tenured radicals. And um, th again, the paradoxical thing is that they're doing this for a general liberating kind of reason. They want to liberate, they want to get rid of this old stuffy, oppressive, you know, um, dead white male tradition. But the people who, <laughs> who make 
real political hay out of this aren't, aren't the progressives. And they don't realize them and reality is up for grabs. There's no telling who's gonna grab it. And um, so the first effect of the kind of postmodern deconstruction um, you know, uh, rise is a kind of party. And there's, there's a party going on in the lit uh, departments and some of the philosophy departments and students are taking out into the streets and they're deconstructing everything left and right and all that. But the thing is, after a while, after the dust settles, um, you realize this is really good for taking things down, but you're not very good at anything, putting anything in its place. So all the lit crits uh, who were unraveling, you know, the great works of the dead white European males, wherever they were, none of their colleagues were writing any great works, you know, for them to unravel. So they weren't generating any work for them. And so, I mean, they were very good at taking things apart. And, uh, and you can see, after all the dust is settled and the party's over, that it's both, both of these movements are contentless. They have no positive content in themselves. Postmodernism simply means whatever happens after, po after modernism. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, I'm always a, a proponent of pre-next thing-ism. That, that's my school. So I'm, I'm for whatever is going to happen, whatever is happening before the next thing happens. So that's kind of the opposite of postmodernist. And deconstruction, you have to have something to deconstruct. You know, it, you, you can't just deconstruct um, from scratch. And so once you've deconstructed everything, what's left? And so it's, <laughs> there was this kind of, at least the way I, I, I saw it, it as a kind of, I don't know, epistemological kind of lull after, after the party and everything's kind of quiet and everything's looking around like, well, what do we do now? And one of the results of this, I would say, is what um, the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur called the hermeneutics of suspicion, in the sense that uh, we, we no longer trust these grand narratives. Um, and we had a whole, you know, there was a whole tradition of this already with Freud, um, you know, undermining our beliefs and ideals and all that and saying everything's about sex, Nietzsche, will to power, or Adler was saying that, you know, power. And uh, Dar Darwin already saying how, you know, all, <laughs> everything is about survival and all that. So already all these high, high ideals are, are, um, uh, have already become under suspicion. But, but at this point, you know, uh, everything really is. And so you have this notion of don't trust anything. But strangely enough, it, it also leaves, uh, let's say, in the popular consciousness, I don't know, collective consciousness, a kind of open-mindedness that is ready to, um, you know, uh, absorb almost any kind of um, strange uh, idea as long as it's different than the official idea. So, you know, we have the David Icke uh, phenomena and a variety of other, you know, um, you know, schools of thought about aliens. And so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dissing ufology or aliens or anything like that. I'm just saying you had this kind of shift from um, the collapse of belief in any of the grand narratives, nothing in their place, and a distrust of everything, especially any official source of information, but an open mind to all of these different particular uh, kind of um, conspiracy theories. So um, here's the line of descent in, in, in the trickle down uh, uh, metaphysics. So we've got uh, Nietzsche, okay? So Nietzsche's up on his lofty mountaintop, um, he's looking out 1880s and he's seeing this dark cloud is coming. Dark cloud is on its way uh, uh, towards us. And this is the advent of nihilism. But nobody pays attention to him, what he's saying. And he goes mad, sadly. Uh, one of the saddest lives ever. And um, okay, so the next person to pick up on um, what Nietzsche saw was Heidegger. And um, he encompasses Nietzsche in his own history of metaphysics and what he calls the dismantling of Western metaphysics, Western ontology, study of being. But he still has this idea of presence on, on Wessenheit in Lichtung. And he still believes in art and poetry, things of that sort, being able to um, um, encounter and communicate being in, in, in the true sense that we, you know, the earlier pre-Socratic philosophers had. And he's very wary of the rise of technology and very critical of how we understand everything in terms of its usefulness to us. Everything is at hand. Okay. And the next, you know, then it's Derrida, 
who, let's forget about presence. So if you, you could say that um, when Sart and company were concerned about people forgetting the question of being, as Heidegger said, and living inauthentic lives, by the time you got to the deconstructionists and the postmodernists, they were saying, well, let's just forget about being altogether. There is no being. There's no real being. There's nothing like that. This is just, this is, a, this is an illusion created by language and, and what we used to think of as metaphysics. And what there is, is this kind of world of language that we never can escape. There's nothing but the text. Everything is a text and everything can be interpreted in a variety of different ways. And again, in one sense, it's like he's not saying anything new because everyone, every writer knows about the ambiguity of language. We all know, and it doesn't even have to be a writer. We all know we got into arguments and, you know, I didn't mean that, oh, really? You know, it's like, <laughs> that, that's part of our, our life. So there's, there, there is this, you know, um, ambiguity in, inherent in language itself, but we try our best and we assume that there is, there is a target. There's a bullseye that we, we can get close to. We can approximate and might not hit it all the time. So it isn't that new, but it, be, it became this kind of, I mean, in many ways, I think it's because literary critics in the, the humanities were just bored to tears. They didn't have anything to do. And suddenly, ooh, they're, they're really excited. And, and, and uh, you know, they're like, uh, it's suddenly like you could play jazz or classical conservatory. You know, it's kind of, ooh, this is a lot of fun. Very transgressive. Okay, so that's happening. Then we have the notion that um, the, 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 not only do we have no contact unmediated with any kind of reality, what we think we're encountering as reality is actually the simulation of it through, you know, a variety of media. And, you know, so we, we have addicted to television. And they said we have television programs about people watching reality TV programs by people watching reality TV. So it struck me that this is what happened. You know, Nietzsche's concern on the mountaintop came all the way down into the lowlands of our Twitter feeds and, and our television sets. So finally, what has Trump got all to do with it? Well, I would say that Trump, as I said, he probably doesn't, doesn't doesn't know anything about any of this. And he doesn't need to, because he took advantage of a kind of ontological ambiguity, uncertainty, uh, an epistemological uh, kind of uh, haziness um, that was in the culture itself. And I said it's from a variety of different avenues. We've looked at this one descent, you know, through Nietzsche, through the academy in that way. Uh, another is the rise of reality TV. And one of my jokes about Trump is that he, you know, um, so much, we put so much reality into the television that in that space, in that inner space, the, it was getting too tight and something had to pop out. And what popped out was Trump because uh, here he is as the apprentice and here he is as well, you know, in his uh, last job. And um, it's, he was primed for the, <laughs> the job he's leaving, or let, let's hope we don't know uh, for sure. Um, through, is being um, this, you know, uh, character on reality television. So the, the simulation, the simulacra, became um, the, the real thing. And, um, and uh, through another avenue was the supposed uh, attempt or work by um, Trump fellow travelers. Uh, this is, the, this is what, how, what led me to write my book, Dark So Rising, about uh, people on the alt-right saying that they used the internet to help Trump get elected. And uh, long story short, they, they created this uh, sort of sigil. They appropriated this character, Pepe uh, the Frog uh, from Matt uh, Fury, who I think is, he's now goes by Matt Furious because he's very angry that they took uh, his character from him. And I think he sued them, but they, he, he turned Pepe into this kind of, um, well, kind of amphibian Nazi, you know, magical uh, sigil. And this, and by flooding the internet with images of Pepe as, Trump and Pepe is the deplorables and all this. This is this helped Trump um, win the election because of what they called synchro mysticism, which is basically synchronicity just transposed to the internet. So synchronicity is something in my head and something out in the real world or the external world coinciding meaningfully. Like what I mentioned earlier about my little experience with coming across the name Heidegger in the Sherlock Holmes story. By chance, an evening I'm giving a talk a lot to do with Heidegger. So the, the, the usual kind of um, separation between inner and outer, you know, uh, was per, uh, 
perforated in that instance. And so they're similarly using the internet, they wanted to do this. And then Trump himself, as I said, was a follower of Norman Vincent Peale, who's um, an American reverend who was very, very popular and very, very influential and, and famous in uh, America in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And, um, and wrote this incredibly popular best-selling book, The Power of Positive Thinking. And it's a kind of magic, um, fundamentally. It's, it, it's a branch of new thought or mental science. So the idea that if you visualize something intently, persevering, determinedly over you know long period of time, and uh, you, you pray to God intently, inflame thyself with prayer in, 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 the, in the Christian uh, context, and um, it will come about. And as I said, uh, Trump took this, well, Peel took it from Carl Menninger, uh, the psychiatrist, and th this, this, this idea that facts don't matter. It's your attitude towards facts. It actually goes back to the Stoic, um, Greek Stoic philosopher Epictetus, who said, it's not things that bother us, it's what we think about things uh, that bothers us. So it has a kind of um, uh, prestigious uh, history. But uh, Trump grew up in this whole context. He went to see, as a boy, he went to see Peel's um, uh, lectures, uh, well, his, 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 um, his sermons. And if you know any of Trump's, I mean, God forbid that you should, but if you know any of Trump's uh, self-help books, and, you know, uh, Art of the Deal and things like that, they're full of all uh, the kind of insights that he had from, uh, got from Peel. So it seemed to me you've got, <laughs> you've got this post, you've got the trickle down, uh, you've got the, um, what do we want to call it? You know, the kind of um, uh, rotating door between reality and television, the reality TV. You got the idea that you can use the internet to shape reality. And it's a, it's a kind of branch of chaos magic. And I, I just should say, in no way am I saying chaos magic or chaos magicians are in any way responsible for Trump. But I do say in the book that he seems to, the way his, his own his own mo his own personal modus operandi seems to be really in touch with uh, a, a lot of the ways in which chaos magic seems to uh, present itself, uh, and then positive thinking. So a variety of different things coming at the same time, saying that reality is um, you know uh, malleable, and that's how we got to where we are to trickle down metaphysics. Now, what has it got to do with Goldilocks? Well, here's the end of the story. Um, I get the idea of the Goldilocks theory of history from the uh, British historian, Arnold Toynbee. And in his great uh, multi-volume work, A Study of History, he comes up with this notion of challenge and response. And this is the motor for how history goes on, how civilizations you know, carry on or don't. And the idea is that um, at a certain point, civilizations face a challenge. And if the challenge is too great, they can't you know, muster the creative spark to, to face it and it collapses. If the challenge isn't great enough, they overcome it too easily and they become complacent and they gradually decay and you have a kind of slow death, a kind of decadence. But if the challenge is just right, then the civilization musters the energy and the insight and the vision to meet the challenge, but also to break through into the next stage of, 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 of its growth. And um, if you see this quote here from uh, 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 Toynbee, where he says, you know, and this, is, this, is, this is not contemporary. I mean, he died in the 70s. And, uh, and so he's writing this, I don't know when exactly, but it's, it's some time ago, but he says of the, 22 civilizations that he studied, 19, you know, I, I, can't, I, I can't read the exact quote here, but 19 basically went down the tubes and they reached the same <laughs> uh, kind of level of whatever development that the USA was in. And he also says down here, civilizations, I believe, come to birth and proceed to grow by successively responding to successive challenges. They break down and go to pieces if and when a challenge confronts them and uh, that they fail to meet. And um, I, I, I mean, he, he doesn't talk about it as Goldilocks, but it struck me this notion of the challenge being just right. And the Goldilocks sort of fairy tale itself is quite strange. It's only from the, it's from the 19th century. Uh, there are three different versions. The original version, it's, it's uh, three 
uh, male bears live together. It's a bachelor, <laughs> menage a trois, bachelor, uh, uh, ursine bachelor mirage, menage a trois. And um, it's an old woman who's kicked out of her home because she's nasty and ugly and, and is just horrible and her family wants to get rid of her, who, who passes by their place and sees you know, the window open and goes in. So it's kind of breaking an entry. Well, I guess Goldilocks does that too. Uh, and then you know, the three guys come home and then whoo, she just runs away. Um, and then the next one, uh, they, the, uh, uh, the later on a version, it's actually Goldilocks, it's not the old woman, but it's three, it's, it's still the, you know, the, the same guys, it's three male bears. And she does the other thing and, you know, the porridge and all that kind of thing. And finally, the last version is uh, Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. So uh, it's three bears, but then there's three things that she tries. You know, it's the porridge, it's the bed, it's the chair. Uh, three versions of the fairy tale itself. So if you know esoteric philosophy, um, in the Hindu tradition, they have what's called the three gunas which are these powers that are necessary for anything to take place. Uh, there's uh, Tajas, uh, Ratas, and Sattva. Um, if you know Gurdjieff's system, he talks about the law of three. If you know your Hegel, it's synthesis, antithesis, I mean, it's thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and a variety of other, I mean, even, you know, going back to uh, Socrates, who we mentioned earlier, you know, this is kind of dialectic, you know, we, there's um, an argument, there's counter-argument, and there's some kind of synthesis. So I don't know if, if that's the intent, uh, if there's any kind of intended esoteric significance in the Goldilocks um, fairy tale, but it struck me as, as a good way of seeing where we are today, because it seems to me, uh, yeah, we are we're facing a variety of challenges. Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm I'm very happy at the uh, the results uh, of the election in, in the states, and it seems incredible that just on the heels of that, you have this idea that we, you know, uh, possibly found a vaccine uh, for COVID. So uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. So perhaps you know we have a chance now to uh, see whether these challenges are are too great, not great enough, or just right. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gary. That was great. Um, can I ask you a couple of questions and then I'll open it up so everyone can ask their questions. I wanted to ask you about who is this, who is this visionary or who are the visionaries that are going to take us out of this kind of current state? And I think about people from the past, like maybe Steiner or Buckminster Fuller or Jacques Fresco, who had these great visions of future societies and more harmonious ways of living and actually seem to have the skills to deliver those concepts as well and i wonder what you think about maybe characters like elon musk and whether or not they have the kind of mm. philosophical or the the wisdom necessary to create a better future for humanity well i have to say i i, I don't know that much about elon musk so um i, I can't say uh, I mean, I, I, I would say, you know, anyone who's turned up to this uh, talk tonight is certainly um, part of the, uh, uh, you know, group of people out there that are trying to <laughs> change things. So, uh, I mean, there's a variety of things. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I found myself writing history, so I, I spend more time looking at dead people and, uh, rather than contemporary ones. But I would say one of the most important books for me that I would say incorporates this notion of threeness in, in uh, Goldilocks is E. McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Emissary, which I guess came out about 10 years or so ago now. And if you don't know the book, it's important because he reboots the whole left and right brain uh, story, which kind of got sidetracked in the 90s because um, serious neuroscientists uh, didn't like that it was getting you know, taken over by new age and kind of pop psychologists and all that. But uh, McGilchrist reboots it, and this is a remarkable book. And it's precisely about um, just, just rightness, you know, to how he sees the kind of narrative. I mean, what, what, what he sees is that throughout, human, throughout history, you know, the, the two sides are in this kind of um, friendly rivalry. And they do things very, very differently. You know, the left and right brain are very different. And to put it in a simplistic you know, way as possible, the left brain is a mic left brain is a microscope because it's connected to there. And the right brain is a kind of panoramic view. So, you know, the right brain sees the forest and left brain sees the trees, sees the individual leaves, sees the cells, you know, sees, you know, sees 
pin, 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 pin point accuracy at the expense of uh, connection to the whole. Whereas the right brain presents the whole, uh, but it lacks that kind of accuracy. And they've, you know, basically they've worked in a system of checks and balances uh, inhibiting each other's uh, excesses until the last few centuries where Bilka says the left brain has kind of become dominant and is recreating the world outside in its own image. So there's less and less of an unmediated world as the postmodernists were saying for the right brain to, to present. You know. uh, but he believes that there are times in history when the two of them work together. And crisis is something that generates the need for that to happen. And we're certainly <laughs> not bereft of crisis. So it may very well be that, you know, precisely because we're in such a bad shape that something will happen, you know, uh, some kind of shift. But I, I think it's something that's going to take place, you know, over time. These things don't happen overnight. Mm. So it, it, it'll take place over time, I would say. Oh. And that's my oh. hope at least. I was watching uh, Idiocracy quite recently, and that paints quite an interesting picture of the future with this, the kind of culture of mass distraction that we live in. And I wonder whether that mass distraction element will hold us back from making the changes that are necessary to improve society, because I know we're, go we're going through difficult times, but actually people are more experiencing those difficult times online than they are in reality often. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, what can you say? There's, there's always obstacles and yeah, there's no guarantees. Um, one of the other people who, whose work um, I've used in trying to understand kind of roughly speaking evolution of consciousness is the German Swiss philosopher, Gene Gebser, who died in the seventies. But um, long story short, he has this notion it's of what he calls, he has these mutations of consciousness um, over, over time. And, he said that we're going through the breakdown of what he calls the mental rational structure, which you can see is kind of the breakdown of the modern view of things, which postmodernism, deconstructionism seems to be, seem to have been gleefully participating in. Um, so um, I, I, you know, as should say, it, very rarely can one see one's own time in, in its own historical context. We're in it. Um, and my, how I, my faith is I, I, I like this notion of what I call the creative minority. And um, I borrow the, the idea of non-locality from um, uh, uh, physics or, or, or uh, uh, brain studies. And physics, it's, you know, when you have the two particles sit together, then they, then they split apart and they're, you know, they've gone totally different directions. There's no connection between them, but they each seem to know what the other one is doing. Uh, and in the brain, you have different neurons that are involved in certain operations. They're not next to each other, but they fire at the same time. They somehow know. So I think there's me, there's you, there's people out there. I don't know who they are. They don't know me. But maybe each of our actions in a certain way are collectively, you know, producing something. So that, I mean, there's no guarantee of that. But there never, there never is a guarantee. I mean, my, my, my belief is that there's, there's always, there's always, it's always a good time to fight for the good, the true, and the beautiful. I mean, there's, 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 there's always things that are worth fighting for. So optimism, pessimism is, is kind of like a red herring for me. There's, there's always, and the other, the other sort of pivot point is what the Swedish uh, savant and religious mystic Swedenborg said, is that do the good that you know. So if you do the good that's right in front of you, rather than, I don't know, um, necessarily having to go far afield to do some kind of good. That, you know, has an immediate local effect. It may not seem like much, but collectively. So well, we are, we are at least forced into our local locality right now, which is yeah, quite exactly, interesting, yeah. actually. Yeah. I'm really appreciating my locality and swimming in the sea and going for walks every day and bonding with uh, the countryside around me. So that could be a good thing. But then you see stuff like HS2 still happening and things rolling on as oh. usual. And well, I, yeah. You think um, if anything would make a government or corporations realize that nature and um, open space is valuable to humanity. It's a situation like this. Hmm. No, I, I, I agree. That's I, I was saying earlier before we started that, uh, you know, the first lockdown in spring, um, I, I, and although for many, many people, they, they don't live by the sea, you know, they, they don't have a garden, they're trapped in, you know, one room, you know, with five kids or something like that. Um, but there was this wonderful feeling that, oh my God, this is this wonderful collateral benefit from all this. The, I can hear, I can, I can smell the air, I can hear the birds, I can, you know, that was fantastic. And um, yeah, it's a shame that in some way, 
um, that wasn't able to carry on. But I don't know. I mean, all those kinds of, sadly, we live, this is the kind of world we live in. It's the bottom line world, you know. It, it, it's always been difficult. It's always been an uphill battle uh, for that, you know, for en any of these, um, how should we say it? What do you want to call them? They're things that are goods in themselves. Not, you know, so this, this is, but this is the fundamental kind of uh, challenge, you know, I would say that um, all of the real important philosophy and spiritual teachings are about in some way. Man does not live by bread alone. You know, we, 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 we don't live to eat, we eat in order to live, and we live because there are these other values. And they're not values that are utilitarian and practical. They're goods in themselves. But that's a completely different way of looking at things. But that's always been a, a difficult, you know, path to tread. That's always been going against the flow of things. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I look at the big picture. I mean, I'm optimistic in the long run, you know, maybe not my generation, maybe not the next generation, but further on, because we, we absolutely have to, you know, in some way. I guess in that respect, like your knowledge of history uh, really helps you. And I think that there is something about um, Merva, who was on the Explorers Club recently, Merva at NASA, she, um, she had a lovely quote out of her, her book, which I'm paraphrasing slightly, but it was like, you have to uh, drink deep from the well of memory in order to have the best possible future. And I think it's really true that we've lost our sense of ancestors generally, and our time scales have shrunk like um, you know, reduced more and more so that we only really see the day ahead of us or the image in front of us. And, you know, our ancestors of only just a couple of generations ago would have really seen their whole lives and had oh, a yeah, great sure. sense of their relationship to the world. Well, think of the difference between a digital clock and the old fashioned clock. Because digital clock is just what time it is now. And the old fashioned clock, you saw the past. Yeah. And you saw the future. And you, know, but you have that just, aspect to it as well. You have that, yeah. um, that rhythm. Well, I was yeah, yeah, that yeah. today. I woke up before dawn today and I went for a walk to see the sunrise and mm. I noted where the sun rose and I remember how it rises now today in comparison mm. to how it mm. rose a few weeks ago and how it rose during the summer. Yeah. And I, when I was on holiday recently in Crete, the mm. sun rose in a different place because I was, I was on the east coast mm. and, um, sorry, the, the north coast. And I felt all discombobulated for my sunrise mm. and sunset. And I kind of realized that um, ancient people would have been much more um, in sync with their natural environment. And that mm. the, the sense of being and what's important in life comes from that observation oh, and yeah. that sense of connection to nature. No, I know. Absolutely. I mean, this is the sort of thing Heidegger is talking about. I mean, yeah. I, sadly, uh, <laughs> sadly, the Nazis were anti sort of tech and science and urban too. So that, that was... That's the kind of thing in that world, there were these, you know, it's, you really, you need a long conversation to kind of like, okay, here's where that overlaps with that. And because Jung, Jung got, Jung got uh, tarred with that rush as well. But yes, you're absolutely right. You know, we, again, it's, it's, it's the loss of contact with an unmediated world. I do feel like we need a philosophy. We have all the technology, but we kind of need a philosophy with which to facilitate all of that hmm. stuff. Well, I, I think I, I think we have the philosophy. I, I think we just have to recognize that all the philosophies that have been saying this are, are right. Mm -hmm. They've been saying it for a long time in different ways. And we, we, we kind of, you know, and it's, how she want to say it? Um, this, what, this is the kind of thing that makes it different and it sounds like moonshine, but what you need to do is a kind of radical realignment of um, values. And, but that, that can come about through real perception. This is how it changes in people's lives. They actually, they don't necessarily just accept it. They accept it as dogma. They have an experience where they, they see that it's real. So I if, 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 I was going to say, well, I mean, I can say, yes, I, 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 again, I was very lucky. I'm, very, I'm one of the lucky people during lockdown. And I wrote an article about this because back in the early bit, bit of it, um, I said, I'm blessed. I have a garden. And um, one morning I went out and, looked up at the sky and I said, what is that? And it was the sun. <laughs> and I was totally surprised by the sun. I thought, what the, is that <laughs> you know, thing up there? And it lasted for a couple seconds, but it was a really strange kind of feeling. And I realized that um, the co combination of a variety of different things, the kind of slightly, the, the sort of 
urgent sense of emergency having to do with COVID. I had to change my uh, 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 daily life a bit different, Did, had to go to different shops and go further afield to go to the smaller shops because the big ones, you had to wait in a big queue. So there was a strange kind of, it's the sort of thing to me that happens, and I don't mean to make it say that I was on holiday, but it's the sort of thing that when you're on holiday where, okay, it's not the same routine you have at home, but you have to develop a bit of a, a, diff, a routine. You know, you go to the shop. You get it was like a cross right. between a holiday and, and war rationing. But yeah, exactly. But it's the, same, it's the same effect that when people, yeah. not too many alive today, who used to say, like the Blitz, it was the best time of my life. I felt more alive. And somehow the crisis makes you feel more alive. And I, I wrote an article about this for New Dawn magazine. And... Um, and it had to do with, well, as I mentioned Colin Wilson earlier, I mean, his work has influenced me a lot. And he has this notion of the robot. And the robot is this labor-saving device which we develop evolutionarily to help us, you know, deal with the world. But it does its job too well. Uh, and it does things we don't want it to do. And what happened that morning, for whatever reason, my robot was off duty and I saw the sun. Me, mm. you know, Gurdjieff would say essence or whatever, or it was being. I had, I, I, I had, you know, the radical, this is my definition of philosophy is the resolute pursuit of the obvious leading to radical astonishment. And this was, this like was a gnosis, like a gnosis kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, immediate, sort of like bang. And then, you know, uh, then later on, it's like, what's that? Well, I know what it is. It's the sun. It's 93 million miles away. It's, you know, you can fit about a hundred earths in it or whatever and so on and so on. But somehow it's almost, I almost felt its physical presence, you know, and this is the kind of thing that, these guys, or at least Heidegger and Nietzsche are sort of saying uh, something happened in the West where we lost contact with that. And I, I, I would say they're right. You know, I, 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 I would say they're right. And I would say McGilchrist's book is important because he can, he puts that kind of philosophical question in the context of, of the, you know, brain um, uh, science and how it's the, the, it's the left brain that I, I, you can say I saw the sun through the, my left brain more that morning, and it just was presenting this the being of of things, the istic type, the isness of stuff. Then, and then you wake up a bit more, and then your left brain comes in and starts, you know, telling you what everything is, and then you get back into the same treadmill of all your experience. That's why we go out of our way to go to Crete or to go to other places and to go, you know, somehow. I mean, one of the one of the strange things, if you know history, is that. People spend lots of money now to go to places that people used to avoid, mm. like the plague, the wilderness. Ooh, I don't want to go there. I was thinking about that. It's like we're trying to go back to this sort of luxury peasant lifestyle, really, where we appreciate nature and grow our own fruits and vegetables. Mm. And that's now mm. the dream. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, but it's, it's also the sense that, I mean, for, for the longest time, people didn't really see nature as something beautiful or the wilderness as something and this was this I would say is evidence for a kind of evolution of consciousness because our awareness of nature changed um, uh, over time. Mm. And uh, yeah, and yeah, exactly. Now it's like, well, th that's the thing. We don't necessarily. <laughs> this is the thing. It's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. So we develop civilization precisely to get away from crisis. We don't want the wolves. So we have to make place so it's nice and comfortable, and the wolves aren't there. And we're very happy about that. But after a while, we get used to it. And again, this, this isn't a moral condemnation. It's just part of how our psyche works. And we have to understand the machine, as Gurdjieff said. So against our best wishes, we get used to these things. And then we seek out crisis or inconvenience, or, you know, as you said, getting back. Yes, I'm going to go someplace, pay a lot of money so I can sleep in a tent and have to grind my coffee. <laughs> I'm going to go pay a lot of money to make things difficult for myself. Well, my and I, I will love it. I will love it. You know. My favorite one is the dark retreat. Have you heard of that? That oh, no, 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 no. dark retreat okay. looks terrifying it's where it you black room? money to just stay in a cave and someone shoves some food in but you don't see anyone for two weeks and oh. it's totally pitch black that's horrifying to me <laughs> well what can i say well th this only proves the point that uh, colin wilson made in many of his books that human, human beings desire and crave that that kind of sense of immediacy authentic being and we will go and do crazy things in order to get it but if we understand what's happening that's what he tried to do in his work and uh, you know Gurdjieff as well and Steiner and all these other people trying to map out these things we understand the mechanisms that take place we don't need to go to those extremes yeah. you know and th that that would be the challenge I mean, and we're all faced with that challenge you know we're all faced we're very good when we're confronting a challenge and we go to pieces when the challenge is gone so can we keep up 
to the metal without having an actual challenge. And this, mm -hmm. this is what we could use our imaginations to do. Well, that's why lockdown has been quite good because it's like you say, it's a kind of, it's a just right, not too terrifying, but terrifying mm. enough threat, even just this mm. COVID pandemic, you know, even the Trump business aside, the mm. pandemic was, you know, you didn't feel that you were at danger of death every minute, but it was just about enough to change your life and make you realize what was important. Mm. Um, there's loads of really good questions here, so I should let everyone else. Oh yeah, sure, okay. please. So Dotty says, do you think there's any connection between the Discordians, Operation Mindfuck and Trump's rise? Um, not directly uh, that, that I know, but um, you know, so, as I say in the book that Trump seems to be a naturally born chaotician uh, and even says so in his own books that uh, he, you know, he likes to keep everybody uninformed until the last minute and he changes his plans at the last minute and um, everything is very fluid and um you know so there's a there's a sense in which he's doing it kind of naturally uh, although i have to say maybe not discordians and robert anton wilson but there's certainly there's there's uh, uh, you know uh, some people that sort of see a connection between trump and crowley uh so you know wilson was into crowley and wrote about him and all that so they kind of see trump as this um well he's kind of the crowned and conquering child in a way if you want he's certainly acting like one now uh, but it's sort of like, you know, the new age of force and fire and all that kind of thing. So, um, you know. You were, you were saying, liberals and all of that enough, you'll find, you'll, you can make him a hero in some way if you want to. But yeah. You were saying that you don't think the chaos magicians that were behind, like the QAnon oh. or the 4 oh, well, are okay. into Trump necessarily, they're just into chaos and creating mayhem. Well, I mean, well, the thing is, again, I, I know chaos magicians here and they're all very very nice people you know so uh, you know uh, but um apparently the meme magic that was being used supposedly by the alt-right in order to help trump get into office you know using the peppy sigil this is a branch of chaos magic in the sense that chaos magic doesn't use the traditional paraphernalia of ceremonial magic it uses whatever is at hand it's a diy kind of magic uh, and so in the old days, what was at hand was, you know, books and magazines and record albums and blah, blah, blah. Now it's stuff on the internet. So that's, that's, the, that's the kind of chaos magic connection there. And then, as I said, in, in Trump's own, well, the other thing too is there's, they're, they're miles apart in uh, their presentation, but the aims and, and, and sort of goals of chaos magic and positive thinking are very similar. They're, they're results-based. Mm. They want to make things happen. That's, that's the fundamental. It's not about contacting your holy guardian angel. It's not about finding your true self. It's about making money come in the mail tomorrow, or I want that job, or something along those lines. And it's about what, uh, what is it, a realizable wish mm. or actualizable reality. It isn't something that's really, really weird and out there that'll never happen. It's something that could happen, but there's some little obstacles in the way. And if you're able to either visualize the outcome powerfully enough, and then act as if it is already the case. That's the secret, but you act as if it already has happened. And then you kind of walk into it, you know, you kind of, you follow it and there it is, you're, you're yeah, on the there's Dow. A, there's you know, a lot of is. them, like Abraham Hicks and The Secret and all that oh, kind there's, of there's, stuff. There's tons of, there's tons it of It reminds me as well, like I've been doing a lot of Egyptology stuff over the last few weeks with the Explorers Club and the, the idea of the hieroglyphs, the Medu Neja, which is to have this manifestation power. So any word that's written, any hieroglyph that's carved magically manifests the mm. essence of that thing into some, uh, into the imaginal realm, I suppose. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, let's have a look at these other questions. Uh, Angela says, has anyone heard of the Great Reset coming out of the World Economic Forum? Um, I haven't. Clue us in, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Angela? Would you like to uh, explain? She, 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 she got excited. So I think she needs to be unmuted. <laughs> uh, where are you? Can unmute her. See what, what some of these are. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, basically it's it's supposed to be some sort of like technocratic dictatorship um where nobody's going to own anything and uh everything is going to be done you know by the, the sort of tech companies and mm. the question is who is actually going to own stuff because they're, they're saying they've got this 2030 agenda where they're saying that um you won't own anything and you'll be happy 
Um, Look, well, I don't know. I own lots of stuff and I'm not happy. So I don't know. Maybe that'll- I don't own anything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I'm, I'm not giving up this wall of DVDs here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very much about owning things. I have to have your own personal things because uh, that's you can well, show your personality. Well, I mean, as far as I can tell, a lot of people on the internet seem to think it's very nefarious and it, I think it's scaring people a lot because they believe that what's happening is that the economy is being deliberately crashed right now hmm. to bring in this great reset uh, so that, you know, yeah. basically everything's just getting demolished and this hmm. new system is going to come in. It's going to be global governance by the UN. Uh, yeah, you get, the, you get the gist, right? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, it, it could very well be. And I, and I know there's the transhumanist agenda says, you know, the singularity is going to happen in 2030 or, or, or something like that. So, um, but, you know, I, I mean, we live in an age where everything is plausible, but nothing is definite. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it could be, I, I, I don't know. And the thing is, if you found out, how could you change anything? Who are you going to tell? What are you going to do other than what you're doing right now? You're talking to us now about it, right? And you, you could be really, I'm just saying, that this, that that's why I've never myself got into the conspiracy theory kind of world, because it's just, it's a series of trap doors. You open one after the other. And, uh, but I, I don't, maybe it will happen, but I, myself, I'm, I'm, I'm a tenaciously holding on to the 20th century. Uh, so I'm, um, you know, um, I, I, I will drag my heels against, because uh, the thing, of, I mean, I, if, if, you know, if someone comes over to your place and you don't have books and you don't have whatever DVDs or CDs, what do you show them? Here's my latest downloads. I mean, what, what, you don't show them anything. You know, that was the whole thing. You come into a place and I didn't, I forget who it is recently, but somebody posted on Twitter about, oh, you know, don't own books. I don't any, own any books. And it's kind of like, and like, no wonder you're a twit. You know? <laughs> it's like, I'm not surprised. So, I mean, um, no, I, 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 I think the thing is, there might be a breakdown of the whole electronic world. That's why I pick up every book. If I see a book at a charity shop and I might not read it, you know, but I think for two quid, get it. Because there might be a time when you can't get these things. And even now when I look on Amazon, all these books I got, I, used to, I, I had, I've been, I've been shipping them around the world for the last 25 years, more than that. Um, they're, they're incredibly expensive. And these old DVDs, I'm a great fan of old horror and sci-fi and noir. So it was all stuff, 30s, 40s, 50s and all that. They were, they were practically nothing when I first got them. Now, if you look online, they're incredibly expensive because nobody has them and you can't necessarily Can I just ask down? one last question? Yeah, sorry, your, what is your, I, I came in a little bit late. Yeah. What is your view of Alistair Crowley? Do you think he's a, you know, a good guy, a bad guy? Do you, maybe <sighs> you don't use those distinctions. I don't know. If only he used his powers for good. If only he used his powers for good. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think Crowley was a man of brilliance, occasional genius, who unfortunately had one of the worst personalities uh, in the world. He, uh, he wasn't evil. He just was completely oblivious of other people and completely you know, hung up on himself. He's incredibly entertaining. I think he knew things. Um, I think the Lema the Book of the Law was a mistake. And the earlier bits when he's, the, his early career sort of, when he's doing something called scientific illuminism, when he's basically trying to understand consciousness and using you know, uh, uh, peyote and a variety of other substances to explore consciousness. I, I, I think all that stuff's very, very good. But the whole Book of the Law and all that is just, I think he invented a whole religion that basically said, let me do whatever I want to do. So that's for me. So I'm sure I'll get some hate mail from any Crowley arts out there. Haven't you? Well, he's a very <laughs> controversial figure, isn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, okay, Sarah. Thank you. My I just pleasure. said, haven't you already had a bit of hate mail? Oh, I've had that's quite a bit. Crowley, I've had quite he's a bit. Very, it's very right. popular okay. in some places. Yeah. No, yeah, no, yes, yes. The thing is, many of these people don't have a sense of humor. I mean, mm -hmm. often the followers are more royal than the king, you know? So uh, these people who are died in wool devotees of whoever it might be, and it's not only Crowley, it's Steiner, Gerger for Jung. It's like, ooh, they own them and they identify with them very much. So if you're slightly critical, I love all these people. I mean, I, I, why else would I have spent the last, I don't know, when it's like 40 something years reading about them and all that, you know, I, I, I don't agree with them, uh, but I think they're fascinating people and I want to sort of understand what's going on. Um, them. That seems to be something that's um, diminished somewhat is the ability to have a civil conversation or a debate with someone that you disagree with. It really seems to have um, just disappeared. Yeah. It used to be even the thing in the 80s used to be able to have conversations with people 
people you disagreed with and now all of a sudden you just block them yeah well i mean that's the other thing too i mean you know uh what was it that um broken black mirror i think it's called where they had one one episode where in the future you you get liked as you go around oh, and yeah, do, you do things yeah. and if you, you this woman loses all her likes and she she's in the street and <laughs> it's destitute <laughs> and it's like you know this is the oh, what do you want to say uh it's the tyranny of the masses in some way. And if you're given this technology in order to do that, but then, you know, the, you know, it's ultimately controlled by the people who, who profit by it. So, um, you know, it's always been like this. It's, it's in some ways, okay. In the great, the problem is in the great war, great cosmic war between intelligence and stupidity is intelligence is at a disadvantage because it has one weapon, truth. And stupidity can do whatever it wants. And now it has facilit it's facilitated uh, uh, in, in doing that with, you know, the whole network of media and communications and all that kind of thing. So at the same time in which many things are now made available, you can find practically anything you want on the net, any kind of rare, arcane, obscure kind of research is also a lot of junk. So, you know, discrimination is key. We have to learn how to discriminate between those things. And that's always the case. So it's just even more now. I wonder if that will become like a new lesson at school, how to distinguish from truth and fact on the internet. <laughs> I've got a really- oh, I hope so, yeah. I've got a really long question here from Angel. She says, uh, I have two questions, comments. One, you said that there was a sort of lull after the postmodern theory moment, after mm. everything was deconstructed, the left didn't know what to do. I think mm. the most powerful thing that was born out of that moment is the queer feminist consciousness culture movement, which is the very thing that stands at odds with the current right. The reason Jordan Peterson was fired, etc. I think in this, there is just as much a strong postmodern current as Trump's reality TV post-truth campaign. And second, do you think your argument is specific to Trump? What about the Bush administration, oh. truthiness, and Karl Rove quote, when we act, we create reality? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I said it's up for grabs, you know, reality. And certainly the whole, you know, gender issue is something that's part of that as well. Um, I mean, I'm, well, I, I think that what did happen on the left, and I could be wrong, is that initially it was liberating. And then, and I think this is historically what happens, the different groups that are liberated start arguing with themselves. You know, so they're liberated from the big thing, then they start liberating themselves in that level. And then there's further liberation and all that. And this is one of the problems. So um, again, this is just, and I'm not really making an argument. It's kind of like, mm, it looks like this to me. So it's not like a strong argument. I'm, I, I just had nothing to do uh, over a, a weekend uh, during lockout. And I said, well, what, what, is, what do I mean when I say trickle down metaphysics? And so I just wanted to say, okay, where does this go? Um, so it's not, I'm not making a strong argument. And of course, you know, throughout history, dictators and tyrants and demagogues have been, um, bent reality to their own uh, aims and purposes. So it's not, it's not specific uh, and e exclusive to Trump, but with Trump, we get, you know, notions of post-truth and alternative reality. They're, they're in the dictionary now, you know, they're, they're something that's in the dictionary uh, now. So this, the, the kind of, it became official. <laughs> that's what I mean to say. It kind of became official, the notion that, yeah, we used to do this and, you know, on the sly, and, and we tried to hide the fact that we were lying, but now we don't really hide the fact that we're lying because we create reality. We, we decide what's real. This is one of the powers of the demagogue, one of the powers of the tyrant. Um, it's not exactly the same, but uh, in Austria in, in the late uh, 19th, uh, early 20th century, I think the mayor, uh, Dolphus, uh, there was the whole anti-Semitic problem. And he said, I decide who's a Jew in this town. <laughs> so it's sort of like the notion, like, I decide what's true. You know, not you, it's me. And, and it's kind of bang. And so that's, I think Trump kind of, again, I, I don't think he's aware of, of, of this kind of, you know, backdrop, this historical backdrop. He just sort of found himself in this place where it was the case. And, and he, was, he was doing that all along in his business career. And suddenly he found himself in, in this, you know, political arena where, where he could do it. So I'm, I'm not, it's not like, oh, Trump is the only bad guy. And, 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 and pe so many people said to me, oh, what about Clinton? What about that? I don't know about them. I'm not, I'm not interested in them. The other people, I'm talking about this right now. It's all this whataboutism. You know, I'm talking about this. 
go, you, you do the research, you can find out about those people. Just go do it, but don't tell me I should be talking about them. I'm, I'm not on anybody's side here. I'm on the side of the good and the true and the beautiful. I'm on the side in the great cosmic war between intelligence, stupidity on intelligence's side. Um, so I'm just trying to point things out and clarify things. But I'm, I'm certainly not, you know, I mean, okay, in terms of Trump and Biden, I just think Biden will in some way, you know, maybe if, if he is able actually to be president, might, you know, bring some kind of normality back, which everybody wants now. I mean, that's the other thing too. It was like, oh, the new normal, we're never going back. Da, 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 da. This is it, everything's changed. And now it's like, we can't wait <laughs> for the vaccine so that we can get back to the normal. We can't wait for Trump to be gone and Biden to be in power so we can get back to the normal. So things change, they accelerate, they're fluctuating all the time. So I just would say, don't unfasten your safety belts just yet. And you know, just, just stay awake and alert, um, just like the government tells us to do. One thing that really interests me, and I wonder what you think about it, is this idea of the simulation that we've created through art and media. And personally, I kind of think that perhaps artists and creatives have some sort of responsibility to create that better vision of the future. I think about things like, I'm a Trekkie, like Star Trek and stuff. They mm. created a, the idea of a quite harmonious mm, future. Mm, mm. And um, there's so much that's, horrible and evil and dark and cold on media that is, is sinking into our unconscious mind and this the zombie I, the idea of zombies the idea of apocalypse is kind of is really in our unconscious all the time now no i i agree um and um i i think uh, well one of the things i i i i've thought of the idea i want to do a movie about the future and nothing's different <laughs> It's 100 years from now, but everything's exactly the same. And there's some other story other than, oh, it's the future. You know, there's an actual story that's got not, it takes place in the future, but it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that it's the future in some strange way. But uh, no, I, I agree. And I think that I'm, I'm of two minds about the whole apocalypse rich popular culture we have. Is one, one mind is that, oh, maybe this will be a catharsis of all this. And we'll get this out of our system and it'll be out there in the unreal world and we'll get tired of it. Or, maybe it just, it'll generate more of a desire for that to happen. Because I do think one of the strength, I, I think we, we are, we have been in a period where we're waiting for something to happen. That, that's why there was such, so many people were so eager to say about, we're never going back to the old normal, it's the new normal. We're really desperate for some, and rightly so, that things are, you know, need changing in a, in a variety of different ways. But there's a kind of desperation um, that impatience with that. And so we, we really want that to happen. And the thing is, you know, we, we have this, we want this mystical thing called change, but change comes in lots of different forms. It doesn't always come in the form that, you know, you, you want it and it'll come because there's a kind of uneasiness, you know, there, 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 there's a kind of uh, anxiety or anxiousness that unconsciously can, can bring it about. So, but I mean, it, in one sense, I, I can't believe is it really over? He got voted out. Is it, was it as easy as that? Just an election? So maybe that's the case. And like, we can all collectively go and maybe start to work on, on some of these other things. And maybe the COVID thing, we can get back to the climate change uh, problem, which is the, the real overarching uh, kind of thing. Maybe we can do that. Maybe that's why I got the Goldilocks. Maybe these are the challenges. Maybe we're going right. to, maybe Let's there'll do be the, the just right challenge that we can- Let's all shape on it. Okay, let's go for that. This is the just right challenge. Um, and, you know, we can collectively, in a variety of different ways, individually, meet it to help this new, you know, new world come into being. Because, uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, along with that, we all, so many things are going to be uh, affecting us. The technology, the whole notion of what does it mean to be human? Um, in, in the definition of human and this is you know all the kinds of things are in you know the, the, the you know the idea that there's not only two genders a variety of different all the trans post kind of stuff is going to be happening in in, in this century uh, and you know it'll probably come sooner than than we think but i just hope all these people that are into this have watched these movies from the 70s all the science fiction movies from the 70s telling us to watch out for this stuff so i, I somehow think they're too young and maybe they haven't seen them well, you got all your DVDs behind you then. Maybe you could bung a few of them in jiffy bags to <laughs> come to my house. You can come to my house. We can watch them and you know, we can do. That. Oh, that was great! Thank you so much, Gary. I'll let you go because we've done two hours now. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure.
uh, I really I, love I, I, I hope people wonderful. enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I'll see you later, everybody. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you, Gary. Bye. Thank you. Bye. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you.